Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate both of you being here with us this morning. Um, uh, kind of along the same lines as Mr. Case's questions, uh, both of you are members of the, of the Capitol Police Board where uh, you weren't at the time of January 6th, but you know, at the, as the structure is, uh, your positions are, and you receive information from um, uh, different air agencies uh, uh, about threats to the Capitol, et cetera. We've, we've, we've heard that process. Uh, we learned earlier this week uh, from testimony given in the Senate uh, that uh, the Capitol Police Board did not receive an FBI threat report warning that there were people traveling to Washington to commit acts of violence. Um, uh, Ms. Pittman, you at, on January 6th were the Assistant Chief of Police of the Department of Protective and Intelligence Operations. I, I hope I have that title correct. And uh, this morning, I believe I heard you say that the Capitol Police did in fact um, receive the said report on January 5th. So my, I guess kind of like I said along the lines of Mr. Case's questioning, Tell me what, what should have happened or what you did to make sure the, the police board uh, got that very important information, uh, or they say they didn't. And so why didn't they? And what happened, what broke down to where a critical piece of intelligence was not shared with the decision makers uh, that may, maybe could have allowed a better, a better preparation uh, prior to January 6th? Yes, sir. So that FBI document that was shared on the evening of the 5th, it was shared with task force agents that are embedded uh, from Capitol Police with the FBI. Uh, they in turn uh, sent their email, that email that they received to a lieutenant within the protective and intelligence operations side of the house. That information was not then forwarded any further up the chain. So that is a lesson learned for U.S. Capitol Police. And I put in corrective measures to ensure that going forward, information is shared in a timely fashion and it's shared appropriately going up the chain of command. Uh, with that said, we do not believe that based on the information in that document, we would have changed our posture per se. The information that was shared was very similar to what U.S. Capitol Police already had in terms of the militia groups, the white supremacist groups, as well as the extremists that were going to participate in acts of violence and potentially be harmed on, uh, armed, I should say, on the campus. So moving forward, we've put in corrective internal controls to ensure that information is shared in a timely fashion because we understand that that was a breakdown in communication. We own that and we've uh, taken protective, uh, corrective measures to uh, change that going forward. But you just said, if I understood you, that even if it had moved up the chain, you wouldn't have done anything differently. That is correct, sir. We do not believe that that document in and of itself would have changed our posture. We believe it was consistent with the information and intelligence that we already had that those groups were going to be violent and they were expected to participate uh, in unlawful activity on the campus. Uh, the, the one thing that we were already leaning forward and asking for was additional resources as it relates to the request for the National Guard. That request at that time had already been denied. And we made that request repeatedly after January 5th uh, to include several more denials before the National Guard were actually on campus. So uh, that would be the request that we did make after the fact. Uh, well, I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, would it be proper to ask uh, to, for the committee to be able to see firsthand copies of, of some of these reports that are being referred to? That would give us you know, better information and context as to what they were seeing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, one more question. I know my time is running short, but I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. 
Gotcha. Um, while, while I was on the floor of the house, uh, as the building was being um, uh, broken into, uh, my staff was in the Cannon, in my office in the Cannon building. Um, and at that time, uh, there was a pipe bomb that had been discovered uh, near the Cannon building. So um, uh, we received, uh, but let, let, let me just try to recount that day as accurately as I can. My staff received an emergency notification from the Capitol Police about an evacuation of the Madison building. I believe that was at 1.10 p.m. The next communication that they received from the Capitol Police were officers running down the hallway, banging on doors and yelling uh, to people to evacuate immediately not identifying themselves. So it was, there was a little bit of vagueness as who was actually telling people to come out of their offices. And then it wasn't until nearly 15 minutes later after they had evacuated that they received official notification about the evacuation of the Cannon Building. And that was at 123. So uh, I guess as an appropriations committee, my question has to do with, despite substantial resources that we have appropriated to your department um, at the request, obviously, of your predecessors. The emergency notification system uh, seems to continue to have issues. And so, um, Madam Pittman, I ask, would just like to ask the question, under your management now, uh, what kind of changes are you looking at to uh, rectify the notification system? Sorry, I was having a little trouble with the mute button. Um, yes, sir. So we've made a number of changes going forward as it relates to our communications. One primarily being those canned messages that we, the department refers to in our joint emergency uh, mass notification system. I believe that Mr. Blodgett referred to it earlier as well. We understand that those pre-prepared messages, if you will, do not give the congressional community uh, in times of critical incidents uh, enough information uh, to proceed accordingly on the campus. So we are working with our command center staff to make sure that they are not just pushing out those pre-prepared messages, but actually providing more accurate, timely information to the community. We're also leaning forward, working with our law enforcement partners, as well as community partners like DCH SEMA, to make sure that our community notifications and improvements are coming from the U.S. Capitol Police's command center. We've also implemented several daily calls as it relates to intelligence and the information that we're able to share in a timely fashion by embedding not only our agents and some of the um, known uh, law enforcement leaders uh, as it relates to intelligence, for example, the FBI, but we also have the uh, law enforcement intelligence leaders embedded now here at Capitol Police. We believe that that will help to streamline uh, the relaying of that uh, information. And also to piggyback just on one of your other questions as it relates to that FBI document, and it ties right into how we're streamlining communications. The FBI already has a Joint Terrorism Task Force uh, Executive Committee, if you will, that is responsible for sharing all important communications with law enforcement leaders. Uh, we believe that that intelligence document, uh, if it had been priority, and as I stated before, it states on the document itself, it wasn't for action. We do understand that that executive committee would have uh, streamlined the communication with law enforcement leaders, if you will, not yeah. just sharing it at the lowest level. Thank so you, sir. Let me just observe about the notifications. The substance uh, of the message, that wasn't the issue. Uh, my my conjection is that uh, if there's a 15 minute delay in, in emergency notifications, then really there's not an emergency notification. Uh, and by the way, those other notifications you're talking about uh, are helpful, but they're kind of like the boy that cried wolf. If we get six or eight notifications for one 
incident in a, in a building on campus, pretty soon you stop looking at them, just, just to throw that out there. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm over my time, but do I, would you allow me one more question? Just since I love you, go ahead, make it quick, <laughs> and, and let's, let's uh, have a quick answer too from the okay, problem. I'll make it really uh, quick. And, uh, this okay. is to Mr. Blodgett, and I know you've heard this question before, but I, I didn't hear it this morning, so I wanted to bring it up. Can, and you said at our briefing the other day that it's your 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 decision here, but I just wanted to ask about the magnet magnetometers entering the chamber of the house. Uh, tell me what a security rationale there is for placing those there. Uh, you know, as members, we don't have to pass through the, these uh, devices to enter any other location on campus. Um, so I'm just curious as to what causes the threat to be imminent right there on the House floor. And then to your knowledge, is there any exceptions to members who, uh, whether or not they have to pass through there? And this is, this is not meant to be a political dig, but this was an observation. On the 4th of this month, the Speaker Pelosi was observed uh, entering the House chamber without going through the metal detectors that she herself, I believe, has have ordered to be in place. So could you could you reflect on those questions for me? Thank you, sir. Um, after the briefing, my attorney uh, slapped me in the head and uh, reminded me that the House voted um, HRS 73 and directed um, fines for complete screening security at the entrances of the chamber. So the screening um, at this point is is within the House rule. Um, and we're there to enforce enforce the rule. Um, in terms of putting up the, the magnetometers, um, we had uh, members stating that they were carrying on the House floor. Uh, 40 USC 5104 states that firearms aren't allowed in the Capitol. With, uh, however, the Capitol Police Board uh, can have regulations to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, there's a 1967 Capitol Police Board regulation that states that that uh, that firearms are not allowed on the House floor. Um, so I have to protect all the members. I have to protect them anywhere. Um, Congress is uh, particularly suited to change that if they don't want me to enforce uh, the statutes that they enact. Um, and in terms of enforcement, I rely on uh, the Capitol Police, who are the experts in the screening, to tell me if a member has not adequately gone through security screening. Um, and once I receive uh, the report from the Capitol Police, that is when I uh, impose the fine. And not because someone said, hey, they didn't do it. They're not the expert. The Capitol Police are the experts. Are there exceptions, are there exceptions to the uh, usage of the, the requirement to go through? No exceptions. No. Um, they, they, they may, there may be someone with a medical exception card, um, which would be consistent with the Capitol Police screening. There's methods that the Capitol Police have to deal with that. So if there's a medical exception, uh, that would be different, but that would be consistent with the Capitol Police policies. Thank you. I do not know. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, uh, Chief Pittman, I just want to follow up on something because uh, that, that Mr. Newhouse uh, brought up, and this has been kind of a theme throughout the, the hearing here. You're saying the FBI document wouldn't change anything. And, you know, the average person sitting in Ohio right now is saying, wait a minute, you, you've got this information through the Capitol Police. The FBI was saying the same thing. It's a whole other issue that that didn't make its way up to you or to Chief Sun. That's a whole other issue uh, about communication and all the rest. But when, when we're sitting here uh, having this conversation, the average person is saying, you're getting all this information of threats. You know these groups are going to be down there. What is your definition of a credible threat? And it's not that you would necessarily have to have to do something super like proactive and go after anybody, but knowing all that, knowing the tone and the tenor in the country, knowing the rally was happening, why wouldn't we have been prepared for the worst case scenario. That's what the average American is sitting home thinking about. So in a pointed way, can you tell us very clearly what is 
your definition of a credible threat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. So a credible threat is a, a threat that can be acted upon. What is the intention? Is there an opportunity for the individuals to actively uh, engage in this threat? Do they have access to the means of making that happen? As it relates to uh, U.S. Capitol Police changing its posture because of that FBI document, I believe that the clarification should be that we were already leaning forward based on that January 3rd assessment. So we were already leaning forward to increase those CDU platoons. We changed the security perimeter plan and all of those things that I've mentioned as it relates to how we beefed up what we had. With that said, I agree with you, Chairman. Hindsight is 2020. There are numerous lessons to be learned. If we were planning for uh, level six, I believe that Chief Sun, if he could get that day back, would have planned for a level uh, 10 uh, security posture. We would have had assets and resources on the ground prior to. We would have changed uh, from bike rack to the global fencing that we have in place now. But all of that uh, is lessons learned. And, and we still have a lot more to learn. But I think that it should be acknowledged that we were already uh, preparing for what we knew was going to be violent acts and civil disobedience for that day, uh, bringing in essentially every employee we had available to us and reaching out to our law enforcement partners uh, to make sure that we had some uh, pre-staged, if you will, which is why we had the immediate response from the Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, we're so thankful for them as well as the U.S. Secret Service. With that said, there were those additional requests for the National Guard. So there was uh, several uh, security enhancements that were requested. But with that said, it wasn't enough. It was well, not I'm enough. Not, I'm not, I don't understand why Chief Sun and yourself weren't pushing for a full vote at the board. That, that to me, if it was such a priority for you, then, then why wouldn't you say, I want to force a board vote, let's bring in the architect of the Capitol. You know, we, we want to know exactly, I mean, to me, it's a, it's a you know, and you're right, hindsight is 2020. But given everything going on, and there are going to be 15,000 people up the street, you know, to me, you adding two more dignitary protection people here or there, and a person, a couple people to go into the crowd, that's fine and that's needed. But the reality of it is, even if you got to the National Guard, it was just a few hundred. We needed the whole thousand at the DC and Maryland and Virginia and all of that. And so uh, to me, it's, you took the intelligence and, and I, feel, I feel like you didn't, didn't put it all together and synthesize it in a way, go, holy cow, I mean, something really bad can happen here. And, and given everything else, going on, we need to be ready for that. And I don't think saying that, well, the Secret Service, uh, you know, didn't see a threat either. That, to me, doesn't cut it either, because who cares? So they got it wrong, too. Like, I mean, that, that's that's the, the underlying issue here, and really just trying to understand moving forward. I think it's going to be important for us to really understand what is a credible threat in this new reality uh, that we're living in.